so welcome to uh, one more edition of the IMSC at 60 Colloquium. All right, so it's a pleasure to have um, Professor Yuli Gross Nicholas from the University of Zurich uh, giving uh, you know the IMSC at 60 talk. Uh, and uh, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor R. Baskar from IIT Madras who made this possible. Um, so, um, So as I was saying, uh, Professor Yuli Gross Nicholas is professor at the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology of the University of Zurich in Switzerland. His main research interest is in developmental genetics. And after obtaining a PhD in uh, Drosophila developmental biology in 1993 from the Biocentrum of the University of Basel, Switzerland, he switched in 94 to working with plants, establishing an independent research group at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory to study plant reproductive biology. And I uh, also understand that uh, for a year, actually, he was uh, in Bangalore at, uh, working at the Indian Institute of Science at the, around that time. Uh, uh, Professor Gross-Nicholas's research focuses on um, explaining the genetic basis and molecular mechanisms underlying three major areas, which are signaling during double fertilization, engineering of apomixis, which is asexual reproduction without fertilization, and the maternal control of seed development, which is largely mediated by epigenetic gene regulation. He has been awarded numerous fellowships and awards, including from uh, the Human Frontier Science Program and EMBO. He's dedicated to promoting the next generation of plant scientists and has taught at many summer schools and international courses. So without further ado, let me invite Professor Gross Nicholas to give his colloquium. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be back here. I visited a few years ago and gave a, a seminar in a small room with a few mathematicians who were interested in plant biology because at that time we actually had made some models for how gradients could uh, be generated in a very large cell that is of interest to us. We still do work at the interface of physics, engineering, and biology. But that math is way beyond me to present here, what our physicists do in trying to model how cells actually can grow by deforming the cell wall. It's largely based on, on uh, simulations and finite element method-based models. And I won't talk about that today. I will really go to my roots and talk about the first topic you mentioned, which is signaling events during plant reproduction. So we have worked on this for many, many years, tried to understand how cells communicate with each other at the molecular level. But in the first part of my presentation, I will just introduce you to the system, tell you a little bit about what we are doing. But then in the second part, I'll tell you about new research of how signaling might happen also, or at least communication might happen also at a quite different level from what we are usually used to. So when we look at, at plant reproduction, it is rather complicated. So that's why people have not studied it molecularly until about 25 years ago when, when my group started and a couple of others. Um, in animals, usually when you have a meiotic division, so that's a reductional division to half the number of chromosomes, the products directly will make an egg and a sperm. There's no development of those. There's just differentiation of these cells. But in plants, we call these products that only have half of the genome, half of the chromosome number, spores. And these spores actually divide and make a multicellular organism. And these organisms we call gametophytes. In lower plants, they consist of many thousands of cells. But in flowering plants that are of interest here, 
uh, they have been reduced to just a few cells. On the male side, this is the pollen grain, and it just consists of three cells. Two of these cells are sperm cells. And on the female side, typically, uh, it's a group of seven cells that are embedded in what we call an ovule or a seed anlage. And after this, uh, the, after fertilization, this ovule will develop into a seed. So we have actually two pairs of gametes that are involved in fertilization. And one gamete pair, when it fuses, will generate the next generation. Again, now we have a full chromosome complement with a double set of chromosomes. And there is development till flowers are formed and the cycle starts again. So we have an extended haploid cycle of the life cycle, a haploid phase, that is unknown in animals. And that makes genetics a bit complicated. And because these cells are deeply embedded into tissue, it also makes it hard to do cell biology or molecular biology. And this generation, the gametophytic generation, has been long-termed the forgotten generation because very few people worked on it. There's a big tradition in India, actually, to look at this at the uh, cytological level, so anatomy. But not the molecular biology and genetics has, as I said, only started about 25 years ago. Now, why would we be interested in these minute organisms that produce gametes? Of course, as I said, when fertilization happens, so there's two sperms that are transported by this pollen tube to the seed anlage or ovule, and then one sperm fertilizes the egg, and that will make an embryo, and the second sperm will fertilize the central cell, which has uh, two nuclei to start with, and it will make an endosperm. And after fertilization, this develops into a seed, and of course, the seed is the basis of all our food. In many seeds, like pulses, it's the embryo that we eat, and in others, like rice and other cereals, it's mostly the endosperm that we eat. But in total, seeds make up about 80 to 85 percent of our caloric intake, either because we eat it directly or because it's fed to animals and then some people eat the animals. So this is a major uh, thing that's very important to understand, how plants actually reproduce, even more so, more so because with the changing climate and always uh, higher temperature, this process is going wrong. And we have uh, had a few people in my group who have studied how high temperatures or drought affect the production of gametes. And very often, this leads to male sterility and the corresponding loss in yield. So to understand the molecular basis of how plants reproduce and also how they may adapt to a changing climate to ensure still safe reproduction is a major issue that is very relevant for mankind. Now, from a basic biology point of view, it is truly fascinating because it involves so many different signaling processes between the male uh, organism, the pollen, and the female tissues. So when uh, the flower is made and pollination occurs, usually the pollen is deposited on top of a stigma. This is our model plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, with which we mostly work. That's like the Drosophila of the botanist. It's a very, very good genetic system to dissect molecular mechanisms. So the pollen is deposited on the stigma, and it has to be recognized. And then the female will provide water to the pollen. The pollen can germinate. And it will grow this very, very long tube, almost like a neuron. It's in fact the fastest growing cell we know on this planet. And it grows at the tip, it grows very, very fast. And its sole goal is really to reach one of these ovules here and bring the two sperms for fertilization. So this is a, a, a period, this growth of the pollen tubes and then finding an ovule, here schematically shown, where the pollen tube has to interact first with these papillar cells, then with the styler cells 
then through the transmitting tract and all these different tissues of the female, it has to know where to go by cues the female provides, it has to react to barriers, and it is in constant exchange in communication with the female tissue. In the end, it gets attracted by a peptide or several peptides that are produced by one of these cells of the embryo sac, and it can follow the path or the concentration of this molecule to find the entry into the micropyle, and then it will eventually release the two sperm cells. So already uh, JBS Haldane realized that this is the key point where you have tremendous selection pressure on the male side. Because whoever is too late, there's many, many more pollen compared to the number of ovules. So whoever is too late is gone for the evolutionary gain. And that's probably why these are the fastest growing cells. They are just post there to go and grow in an incredible speed. And that's something we try to understand also on the physical side, working together with engineers and um, physicists. But today I focus more on the signaling events and the cell biology we can do. What you see here are two synergid cells. They are the first cells that will interact with the pollen tube. And we look at the calcium signal. And this is the pollen tube approaching here. We also look at calcium. And you see before it touches it, just being close, the uh, two synergid cells get a bit excited. They start to flash with calcium. Calcium is a second messenger. And as the pollen rests for a while, and then it starts a very rapid growth across one of the two synergid cells, the synergid is flooded with calcium, and then boom, the pollen tube exploded. It released the two sperm cells, the synergid died, and now the two sperms, which you can't see, will fertilize the egg and the central cell that would be in this area. So this whole process takes about 25, 30 minutes. You could see that already before the pollen tube actually touches the synergid cell, it starts to flash. So there must be a, at least a short distance signal that's sent. As I told you, the pollen tube is attracted by a signal. It's a small peptide that's uh, received by a receptor and then signals into the cell that it should stop growing for a while. And then these two cells need to communicate first, get ready for this last final stage of their interaction. So um, before we could image this life and before uh, geneticists started to look at this process, most people thought that this pollen tube reception was purely mechanical. Yes? So they are brought together by the same, by the same uh, pollen tube, and they will be released together. Uh, what this means, if you think about it genetically, the two sperm cells are genetical twins. They are identical. Also, the female gametes are identical. So you, you have a, a uniform product in terms of genetics. Uh, very rarely, if you have two different pollen tubes coming, you can get discordant um, products and then there can be also competition. But usually they are like monozygotic twins, but they are derived by two fertilization products and not by one that's split like in, in humans, for instance. So um, the, the need why they have to be released together, I don't know, but since the pollen tube dies, that's probably the only way. You know? The pollen tube really explodes. I mean, you saw it, it right? It really explodes. And then the two, how the two sperm cells get there, they need to be activated, we know that. Again, by signals made by the egg, small peptides that it secretes. And they get activated and then they can fuse with the egg. They're real cells, they're not just nuclei, they're sperm cells, just like any other sperm cell. But people thought that this process basically was growing in, pushing into this cell, and they thought the pollen tube would be surrounded by a lytic environment that led to the lysis of the tube, maybe just by osmotic pressure. Now, 
uh, we found a mutant about 25 years ago that shows that this cannot be true. Because in this mutant, um, the pollen tube does not burst. So it comes and finds, you see this here, we call it the mutant feronia. The pollen tube enters through the micropyle as it should, but instead of bursting, it keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. It never releases the sperm, and so it never affects fertilization. Now the clue here is that this pollen is wild type, this pollen tube. What is mutant is the female. But on the female side, we see no defect. The, the strong behavior we see, or the wrong behavior we see on the male side, that tells us communication between male and female has to be defective. And it's the female that has an active part in receiving the pollen tube. It's the female that, using this gene product, decides whether a pollen tube bursts, as here, when it's a wild type, or if that gene product is missing, the pollen tube cannot burst. So the female controls whether the sperm is delivered using this gene that we named Feronia after an Etruscan goddess of fertility. Now, later on we found this is a, when we cloned the gene molecularly, it's a typical receptor kinase. So it has a, a kinase domain that's inside the cell. It has a transmembrane domain, so it goes through the cell membrane. And then it has an extracellular domain with two molectin domains that were thought to probably bind polysaccharides. And they may, but they certainly also buy other, bind other things. And we found this was a part of a large family of 17 such genes that are present in the Arabidopsis genome. And over the course of the years, we studied mostly Feronia and its two most closely related receptor kinases. Feronia is expressed everywhere, in all cells almost. Um, it was found through this defect in fertilization, but uh, Angsur, it's not expressed in the pollen. And Angsur 1 and 2, these are named after the, the male consort of Feronia in, in Etruscan mythology. They are only expressed in pollen. And they are somehow the counterpart. If these are missing, both of them, because they are functionally equivalent, you need to disrupt both genes, then the pollen germinates and just bursts. So in a Feronia mutant, the pollen tube does not burst. And in an Angsu double mutant, the pollen tube bursts immediately. So it's like a male counterpart. And we have learned over the years a lot about how these receptor kinases signal downstream and what they affect. I'm just going to show you one or two of these things. Um, what you see here is exactly the movie I showed you before. It's a, a kinetograph showing you, a chymograph showing you the same movie. We had here, uh, the top part here is the pollen tube. This is the tip of the pollen tube as it approached the ovule. Uh, it rested for a while grew very slowly, then we had the fast growth and the rupture. And these are the two synergy cells. We see even before the pollen tube arrives, they start with these oscillations. Then the receptive synergy that also dies in this process is flooded with calcium and then it bursts. The synergy that survives will later on start to oscillate again. And if the fertilization was unsuccessful, it will attract a second pollen tube, but only if it was unsuccessful. And then there is a second chance for this ovule to make a seed. Now, if you look in a, what happens in a Feronia mutant, um, or also in a mutant that is the co-receptor of this receptor, so the two work together as a, as a pair, we don't see any of these calcium oscillations. So this means that you need the signal coming from the pollen signaling through this receptor kinase to make these calcium oscillations. And if they don't occur, then the pollen tube doesn't burst somehow. Probably because some downstream effects in the synergy cell don't happen. And the later events with the rapid growth, that still happens, but the burst doesn't happen. And uh, through collective work of our group and others, we now know that 
calcium regulates this, uh, ferronia regulates these calcium oscillations. It also regulates vesicle fusion. So we found another gene that's required for this process, another protein. And usually it is uh, inside small vesicles in these two synergy cells that receive the pollen tube. And once the pollen tube arrived, these vesicles get secreted to the surface. And they are important for this interaction. How exactly they do that, we didn't know until about two months ago when a paper was published in Nature showing that this protein together with the receptor kinase seems to form a calcium channel. And that's how it controls the calcium oscillations. So, and then it was also found that it regulates reactive oxygen species. So both calcium and these reactive oxygen species are known to be important downstream signals, second messengers inside the cell for these signaling processes to happen. So at the moment, we, we know a few things about this interaction. So this is, again, the synergy cell. You have the ferronia receptor. You have this Nortia protein that's secreted once signaling occurs. And the receptor interacts with a co-receptor called L'Oreal I and some other molecules in the membrane um, or the cell wall. And there is a, a, a peptide that's probably secreted by the pollen tube that activates this. And this peptide belongs to the so-called family of rapid alkalinization factors, or RALFs. And these RALFs play signaling roles in many diverse systems, from cell growth over uh, innate immunity in plants to reproduction and development. And recently, it was shown that they, some of these produced by the pollen tube can at least physically interact with ferronia. Whether they really, really do this job is still a, a matter of debate, because they already have earlier defects in development. But over the years, um, an, a, an ever-increasing community of people who work on ferronia have uh, accumulated evidence that it uh, regulates many, many different processes in the plant. They start from uh, different hormone responses or hormone signaling in plants, over regulating energy metabolism, uh, the innate immunity response, as well as a drought response, in addition to the developmental aspects that I have mentioned, or so aspects in reproduction. And we have now quite a complex network of downstream acting factors involved in these different pathways. And we have mostly worked up at the top. We identified the receptor, its ligands in some contexts, also a downstream kinase, this one that acts both in the pollen tube and probably in the synergy. Also, this is not yet clear, to transduce the signal and then also the enzymes that produce the reactive oxygen species. So we have worked up here, and then different uh, groups have contributed to different aspects of this very complex signaling network. So this is a, a classical signaling. We have a small peptide signal, a receptor for it, and then that signal is transduced inside the cell where it evokes different responses, be it physiological or developmental responses. And before I go to a, a completely different type of, I would call it signaling, um, I want to want to show you the last bit where we think what's happening in this uh, synergy cell. The synergy cells that receive the pollen tube to allow fertilization, they are like gatekeepers. They sit at the entry of the micropyle. They are the first cells interacting with the pollen tube. And how they do that is still poorly understood. And recently, a graduate student in my group, uh, Nick Tenoyer, started to do uh, various life imaging approaches to really also look at these ROS signals in the cell, but also other aspects. And one of them is what really happens um, when the pollen tube arrives here. This is a picture actually from tobacco, but it is a transmission electron micrograph. And you can see the two synergies sitting here. Here is one of them, here is the second one. And you see the, the nucleus is up here, a vacuole at the very end. And they have this strange structure here that we think is, 
invaginated membranes that are very strong in secretion. They produce a lot of secretory products like small peptides. Um, and it's called the filiform apparatus. And that's where the pollen tube interacts first with the synergid. That is before the fertilization happens, yes. But I've shown you it grows very fast. Once the pollen tube arrives, it rests a bit, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Then it grows fast at first. And people think it goes inside the synergid. Other people think it goes outside the synergid. Uh, first, we thought it would just burst here. Then uh, Sundarezan's group uh, at uh, UC Davis showed it grows across. And you could see that very nicely in the movie. But how exactly it enters the embryo sac is not known. And so he um, tried to, uh, if I can move on, tried to look at this using new microscopy techniques he developed. We know quite a bit of proteins involved that are expressed in these synergies. I've just talked about the last bit here, uh, and I don't want to go into the details of it. This is a model of this cell. So, so we have here a vacuole, then we have the nucleus. This is the so-called endoplasmatic reticulum. Yes. Over here? So this is actually the ovule and just the cell walls. So each of these units will be a cell. And here, this is, these are actually the synergids here. And, we, and he tried to reconstruct them by doing uh, multi-photon 3D imaging. And if I can move on, um, so he, these are stacks going through these cells. He first used a labeled pollen tube and uh, just a cytoplasmic marker in the synergids. And it, it's not quite clear what happens, but it looks like it goes through the cell, not outside on the cell, if he reconstructs this. But to really be sure, he, we need a membrane marker to know where is the membrane of the pollen tube, where is the membrane of the synergy. And so he constructed those, he put them into plants using gene technology. And uh, here you can see the membrane of the pollen tube and you can see the membrane of the synergy cell. And it actually pushes the membrane in. It's like the, when the pollen tube comes, it pushes it in and the pollen tube is surrounded by the membrane of the synergy cell. And this, this may not look familiar to you like anything, but this is exactly how it looks like when a fungus enters a plant cell. For instance, a beneficial fungus like a mycorrhiza that provides nutrients to the plant from the soil. It doesn't destroy the plant cell it goes in. It actually pushes the membrane in and makes something very similar to that. So it seems like it pushes it in. So there's a lot of physical forces going on there. And we think that the pollen tube rests for 15, 20 minutes. It's because the synergy has to reduce its turgor pressure and rearrange its, its cytoskeleton so that the pollen tube then can push in without having too much counterforce from the turgor pressure. So there's, you know, we try to understand this. There's a lot of physics going on, but it's very, very hard to study. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. So it, it involves secretion of enzymes that degrade the cell wall. Now these plant cells are surrounded by a cell wall. And the fungus, or, or probably the pollen tube, has to go through this first. And then when it comes to the membrane, that is a, a lipid membrane, it seems to push through. That's possible if the turgor is lower in the recipient cell than it is in the pollen tube. Right? Okay. 
So I think both the pollen sends secrete signals and the synergids, we also know secrete signals. So to attract the pollen tube, we know the signal, it's also a small peptide. To, uh, the, for the pollen tube to tell the synergid I'm here, it's probably these Ralph peptides. And there are many, many steps in signaling that may involve other aspects. This is all in vivo. This is live imaging. Yes. So the first movie I showed with calcium, this was done a while ago by a postdoc, Queen Go. And uh, it was extremely labor intensive to do this, very difficult. Uh, Nick has now scaled this up tremendously and he images 10 ovules at the same time, so we can get a lot more quantitative data on this. He's mostly used it for the ROS signaling and has looked at how these reactive oxygen species evolve in the cell, in the nucleus, in the mitochondria as the pollen tube approaches. And th there is some very interesting uh, results coming out, but his setup to do life imaging really enables us now to do many other things including a very careful look at what happens when the pollen really enters and when it bursts finally, which till now we couldn't really look at. So if there are other questions regarding this uh, general signaling part, uh, that would be the point. Otherwise, I will move on with a completely different question. So it seems that the, sorry, it seems that the signaling is actually somehow uh, leading to a metabolic rewiring because you are mentioning again and again ROS and it seems that if you are secreting those enzymes which have to degrade the membrane for, for entrance there, there is a metabolic switch here or shift at least yeah. a big one which may be important for the entry of the to, into the synergy is that yeah is that so there's some kind of signal that then triggers the cell to prepare for death right so uh, we think it's a kind of programmed cell death but it's rapid, so it may not go through all the steps that uh, are typical of a programmed cell death. But it needs to involve a rearrangement of the cytoskeleton and of the turga for sure. Otherwise, this is not possible. Um, so now, once this pollen tube has entered, it pushed through the synergid, eventually it bursts, probably by influx of ions and just pumping up turga pressure. Um, the two sperm cells are released and then they merge to make a, a, a fertilization product. One will be the embryo, the zygote, and then the embryo. The other is the endosperm. And we really do not understand how that then leads to the initiation of development. What activates these cells to now start divide and make more cells? Um, and this has been a, a question we have been particularly interested with respect to the endosperm. So here you see the central cell nucleus. It's larger because it's derived from two nuclei and, and the egg cell nucleus in red. And then after fertilization, you first have two or three divisions to form endosperm before the zygote even divides. So this activation of the endosperm to divide, to proliferate, is quite quick um, and we found mutants many years ago we and others that do this in the absence of fertilization that they start to divide and there's no pollen there's no sperm so somehow in a wild type in a normal situation this cell must prevent division and when that gene product is missing it just happens but what triggers division in the normal situation? Why this cell waits till the sperm arrives and only after that it divides is completely unknown. So we, we um, were wondering whether there are, what are these maternal factors that prevent proliferation and what paternal factors are required to initiate proliferation? That's also a kind of signaling. Now you, you wait for the signal coming from the male to then start moving and dividing. But in this case, the signal is something very different. It's not the peptide and the receptor for the peptide and something like that. 
So this is very recent work that we worked on over the last couple of years. And uh, normally when an egg and the sperm meet, both of these are arrested at the same stage of the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is when the cell goes through first re replicating its genome, then it's in a resting phase, then it set, divides the genome onto daughter cells, again it's in a gap phase, and then it starts synthesis of its genome again. And to initiate the development of the zygote, the phase of the cell cycles between the two nuclei, they have to match. It cannot be that one already doubled its genome and the other one not. That would lead to a complete mess once it starts dividing. So they have to be in sync. No, the, the, the sperm and egg are arrested at the specific phase of the cell cycle. And then when they come together, they have to be in the same. Now, when that happens, when they are haploid, they don't divide, no? But they can be haploid and have already duplicated their genome. So they are haploid, but they have two copies, two chromatids, so 1N2C. Or they can still be 1N1C. They have not doubled their chromosomes yet. And they would still be haploid, right? That's both possible. They can be before or after synthesis. So, so here you see the classic cell cycle. This is S is synthesis phase. You are uh, replicating, duplicating the genome. Uh, then you are in a gap phase after that. Then you have mitosis, so you separate the two chromatids onto the daughters. And again, you are in a gap phase before the next cycle is initiated. Now, in most eukaryotes, if you look very broadly, you know, in protozoa, in many, many different systems, you find that the gametes are actually in G1. So they have finished their my meiotic division, their reduction division. There's just one copy of the genome, that's it. And they wait there. In, um, however, in higher eukaryotes, like us or uh, other vertebrates, um, actually the G is in the middle of meiosis, the, the egg. And when fertilization happens, it first has to finish meiosis. This is a peculiarity, but in the end, they're going to be in the same cell cycle phase. In Drosophila, for instance, you have fertilization, then you finish meiosis of the egg, and only then the, the nuclei fuse, and then you start to proliferate. Um, in flowering plants, uh, these are all very old data and old reports. So the techniques were not the best when this was done. But you find everything in the literature. They can be arrested in G1, in S phase, in G2. And in our model, Arabidopsis, it's completely conflicting. There's a very good paper that's 20 years old that says the sperm are in G2. If the sperm are in this phase, then the egg and the central cell should also be in that phase. Now, uh, people looked on the egg side, and they are not agreeing on where it is. Different groups say different things. So we decided we look at this more carefully. First, in which phase is the central cell? And what you see here, these are cells outside, diploid cells of the ovule. These diploid cells, they should have a content of two or four. They are diploid, so if they are in G1, it's two. If they are in G2, it's four. And if they are in between, it's in between. Right? So this is, this is our kind of standard or normalization. The, cent the egg cell seems to be, when we look very early, uh, going from uh, one copy of the genome to two, so it's in S phase. And then the egg really has two copies. So this is in G2. And only after fertilization, which happens about here, it moves then up uh, from two to four because the sperm is also in 2C, right? So then you get, you have uh, four, two chromatids of 2N chromosomes. But if you look at the central cell, actually, it's this one, it should be four, but it's neither two nor four. 
it's somewhere arrested around three. And only when it gets fertilized, it goes up to six where we expect it. So that, if you interpret that, it means that the central cell is actually arrested in the middle of S phase somewhere. It's not in G1 or G, in G2, as most people would expect, but it's actually in the middle of S phase. And if you look at gene expression in these cells, so we isolated these cells using laser capture and determined their transcriptome, and now we just look at genes involved in the cell cycle, you see that the egg cell actually, not so many genes are active, but there are a few that are for this G2 which is consistent with the data. But look at the central cell. We have all these red is active. All these genes important for S phase that are active, a lot of them. So um, we then wanted to, to prove that really these cells are in S phase, in the middle of S phase. And we did that by incorporating a marker into DNA that's only incorporated when a cell actually synthesizes. So when a cell is in the middle of S phase, uh, again, these are the sporophytic cells outside. There's not much going on. Uh, the egg cell, not sure where the cursor is. In the egg cell, nothing changes. There's no incorporation. But you can see that uh, for the central cell, once the first ones get fertilized, and then more get fertilized, actually we see incorporation. That means that once it's fertilized, it starts to finish synthesis. It was arrested somewhere in S phase, and it gets fertilized, and now it finishes, so it incorporates this nucleotide. And we can also visualize that with other markers. This is a marker that's typical for S phase, and we quantify that after fertilization, it goes down, so it means it was in S phase, it gets fertilized, and it disappears. So all of these three different assays are consistent with this very unexpected finding that, in fact, the central cell is in the middle of S phase. So we think that the egg cell, as has been proposed 20 years ago, is indeed in G2, but the central cell is in the middle of S phase, it gets fertilized, and then it finishes replication. Now, if you know something about how the cell cycle is regulated, you can guess which protein may be important for that. And this protein is called retinoblastoma. Um, and the retinoblastoma protein is well known from uh, humans because it's a tumor suppressor gene that when mutated, leads to tumors of the retina in the eye. It's often genetically transmitted and leads to tumors in young children. Um, the, this is a very widely conserved protein. It also exists in plants where we call it retinoblastoma related, so RBR. And herbidosis has one of those genes. Now normally, RBR sits on the DNA and prevents S phase. And then there is a kinase complex, a cycling dependent kinase. And this uh, kinase complex phosphorylates RB before S phase. RB gets degraded. And then um, when it's degraded, S phase can proceed. But if this, sorry, if this cyclin-dependent kinase is inactive, like here, because the cyclin is missing, it is arrested in S phase. So we would predict that RB does not get degraded, and that's why the central cell is in the middle of S phase. So um, we looked at, at this, and here we can actually visualize RB, and indeed, in the egg cell, we don't see anything, but I hope you can see a weak signal in the central cell. Here, this is the central cell nucleus. Up on fertilization, it disappears, and then it comes back with the first division of the endosperm. So indeed, uh, RB is still there before fertilization, so this cell is in the S phase. Then it gets degraded, it completes S phase, 
and then you start the next cell cycle. We can show that this doesn't uh, happen when we use inhibitors. So here is the normal the signal for RB. It gets degraded up on fertilization. If we inhibit the proteasome, it cannot get degraded. And these are two different inhibitors that work well. And this is a mammalian inhibitor that works a bit less well. And if we do this, the central cell does not divide. So this is very consistent that indeed you first need to finish the S phase, the cell cycle, and then only you can divide. Now the question is how does the cell do that, right? How can the cell be arrested there and only when the pollen, the sperm comes, it gets activated? So to do this, we looked at the very narrow time course of gene expression in just the central cell. Okay, there was no question. <laughs> so we, we looked at the before fertilization and four, eight, and 12 hours after. And uh, you know, around eight hours, most of the ovules are fertilized. Um, and we looked for things that were absent. These are just cell cycle genes that were absent in the central cell before fertilization and then present at. And this particular gene here is a cyclin and RBR gets degraded by a cyclin-dependent kinase. So this product very likely comes from the sperm, right? Based on its expression profile. So this is the only D-type cyclin that's expressed in the pollen. It is known that it mediates S phase entry and progression by promoting RBR degradation in a completely different context in one cell lineage in the leaf. And uh, it was known on already that if you overexpress this particular cyclin in the central cell, it actually causes division. So we checked whether indeed this cyclin is expressed in the sperm, and it is. It's not there in the egg cell and the central cell. After fertilization, you see a signal, and later you see it in both fertilization products. You see this at the level of the RNA, and you see this at the level of the protein. And when we mutate this, it's a bit cumbersome because there are many of, there are many copies of related proteins. With a single mutant, we get a weak effect. But what we see is compared to the wild type, we have a delay in cell division that's quite significant. And if we also mutate for additional similar cyclines, this effect gets much stronger. So if you look here at 12 hours, uh, almost all of them have divided once, or, or, or half of them divided once or twice, and here only 10, 15% divided once or twice. So this is completely dependent on the pollen, not on the female. So this is a paternal effect. You need this cycling from the father's side, and only if the cycling comes, uh, you actually don't get this effect, right? That was shown here. So the summary is that the the quiescent egg cell is in G2, as was expected, but the central cell unexpectedly is arrested in the middle of S phase. The S phase is then completed upon fertilization when RBR gets degraded. If you block this degradation, it doesn't enter cell division. And the cyclin D7 is coming with the sperm. It's delivered with the sperm in the sperm cytoplasm to the female gametes. And then there, it will associate with the kinase that's already present. It will form an active kinase. It will phosphorylate RB, and it will finish the cell cycle, or the S phase. So we have maternal factors, the cyclin-dependent kinase that's already waiting there in the central cell, and the paternal factor, the cyclin, that activates it to actually start development. So this, you have a complex, one half is in the central cell, one half is in the sperm. Only if they fuse, the complex comes together and development can start. So this is a completely different type of signal that starts development that is based on having half of the complex on the male and half of the complex on the female side. So here we have the female. Sorry, 
Yeah, there was one other one. It's a, 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 a CDK inhibitor. And we have made mutants in that one, but not seen anything. But it's a big gene family. So there may be genetic redundancy. We may have to mutate six, seven of them to see something. Here also, the, the single CD cyclin D7 had an effect, but if we also removed other D cyclins, it had a stronger effect. Right? But so we have the central cell. It's arrested in S phase. We have the CDK sitting there already, but the cyclin is missing. The cyclin RNA and protein is actually brought in by the sperm. When they fuse after fertilization, we form now an active CDK complex or cyclin dependent kinase. The cyclin dependent kinase will phosphorylate RB, it degrades RB, we finish replication, and we start proliferation. So we have a completely different type of signaling, and we understand now at the molecular level how actually this development can be initiated, can be started. And this uh, work was performed mostly by Sara Simonini, all the RB work. Uh, Stefano, he made some of the constructs. We saw there were many markers we needed to use and so on. He made these constructs and transgenic plants. And Nick uh, Denoyer, he made the imaging that I showed at the beginning of the synergy cell. And some of the bioinformatics analysis was done by a former student of mine who now has a small bioinformatics company and still works for us in terms of, of analysis of gene expression, etc. And with that, I'm uh, closing. And thank you very much for your attention and look forward to more questions. I have a very general question. I'm always fascinated by, during the development, the symmetry is maintained. For example, when a baby is born, it has identical ears, left and right. So is there any, are they pre-programmed locally, or is there any communication that as the ear is growing, that uh, so the, the symmetry? Yeah. yeah, the symmetry is maintained largely. So this has been studied quite a bit in vertebrates, like in mouse. But of course, for some organs, the symmetry is broken, right? Most, mostly internal organs. And people understand quite well how that breaking of symmetry works. But how, how the symmetry, symmetry is, maintained? is maintained? I'm not sure. But usually, also in plants, the simplest way to divide a cell is the simplest rule is to divide it symmetrically. Always uh, along the, sh the shortest wall you can build in between a large cell when it divided or is dividing. Now, the difficult thing is the breaking of the symmetry. So to but make a division questions? asymmetrically, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, this also, of course, happens here in the zygote and, and in many steps, and there it's usually the phytohormone auxin is involved. How exactly this is a big area of research, not yes. in our lab, but in others. My question is, I understand at the level of division, but after some growth, the left eye is growing, and right eye yeah. are spatially apart. How do they know they, have, they are doing it correctly? Is there any? That's I don't know. Okay. And I think it's not well understood in larger mm -hmm. organisms that they are made so symmetrically, even so both halves, yeah. you know, at some point are very distant and independent. How do they? Yeah. But you would have to ask a vertebrate developmental biologist. <laughs> I'm not a specialist in this field. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, so you had mentioned that uh, the gene Ferroria gradient is involved in the calcium channel formation for oscillation. And you had also mentioned that if fertilization does not occur, the oscillation is repeated. So how is that uh, signal that non-fertilization occurs in this case? So this is a complicated process that 
that you need fertilization of at least one of the two cells was shown by quite uh, really elegant experiments in Higashiyama's group in Japan. So they made uh, experiments where they had only one fertilized or only the other uh, using a genetic trick and they could show as long as one of the two is fertilized you stop the oscillations. But if none is fertilized a second pollen tube can be attracted. Um, now the signaling from this is a, a matter there is one line of evidence that there is signals going fr from the zygotes or the, the fertilization products to the synergy via ethylene. Ethylene is a plant phytohormone. There is a, a, another completely different type that may contribute to that and that's when fertilization happens and the endosperm starts to develop. The surviving synergy actually fuses with the endosperm. So there's a cell fusion and that was uh, again that was described by Rita Grossart's group together with the Higashiyama group. And of course once it fused and becomes part of the endosperm, but there is actually one diploid cell in the triploid endosperm or one diploid nucleus because of cell fusion. How this molecularly works is not well known. Uh, is it largely a signaling process or is there a core gene regulatory network which we understand with this process? So I, I would say this is a core cell cycle regulatory process but because you have the, the two components you need for an active kinase separated into the two gametes it ends up as a signal to start development. Right? The formation of the complex is like the license to start dividing. So that, that's why I say it's a different form of signaling. But this is a core part of the cell cycle. It was just separated into the two gametes. Um, how are there exactly two sperms only that are allowed? Is there like... Uh, uh, <laughs> it's an interesting question. So this is regulated at the level of pollen tube reception, right? Or pollen tube attraction. So usually only one pollen tube will go and enter into the synergy. So there must be a repulsive signal once the first arrived. And uh, people think that it's nitrous oxide, which is a, another gas that has physiological effects that may repulse it. Um, and that seems very likely. There's quite good evidence for that. So the, once one successfully arrived, you have two things. You start to make a repulsive signal and you stop making the attractive signal. That was also shown. Okay. And uh, just to follow up, is that uh, uh, in terms of evolution, uh, how do we lose, say, one sperm and then one, uh, you know? So in, in all higher plants, let's say, angiosperm and gymnosperms, they all have two sperm. This is a one invariant thing. Every pollen grain has two sperm. That's very unusual. No, most things there is variation, but not in that one. So on the female side, 70% have these seven cells, but there's seven, eight other types of female gametophyte that were really well described, actually, mostly by Indian botanists, Maheshwari and his, uh, his progeny, so to, so to say, scientific progeny. And there's many, many variations on the female side and zero on the male. So that two sperm containing pollen must be super successful and you don't want to change it evolutionary. Uh, so I had a doubt, um, say for any factor whatsoever, the pollen tube contains only one sperm and fertilization happens only for the egg cell. Embryonic development starts but the endosperm formation does not start. Mm -hmm. What happens then? So the embryo will develop up to a certain stage, a stage we call the globular stage, and then it stops. So to go past that, it will need the endosperm, which you can think of a bit like a placenta that provides nutrients to the embryo. And it has, uh, functionally, it has very much the role of a placenta. And if, if you have only one fertilization of the egg, it will stop. So in that case, will the other synergid activate pollen tube formation again for fertilization of the endosperm? Um, 
I, as, let's say, based on the knowledge we have now, I would say this rarely happens in nature. Because you had one event that should signal it's fine and there should not be a second pollen tube coming. Now, of course, you can try to trick the system, right? So in, in, in maize, we also do some work in maize. You can do this quite easily. You can you have massive amounts of pollen and sometimes, quite often, a few percent of the time, two pollen arrive at the same time. Then you have four sperm and you can actually also get individuals where the genotype of the endosperm is not the same as that of the embryo and geneticists use that to figure out where a gene is required. In Arbidopsis, this is much harder. Uh, we have done it, but it uh, uses quite a number of genetic tricks to do this. Uh, sir, the, um, what, what I had to ask was, the, you mentioned something called the filiform apparatus as part of the synergic cell structure. Yeah. Uh, structurally, how, what, is, like, what is the structural composition of that? And if, if it is like acting as the entry point for the pollen tube, can, it, can something be derived from that? So, we don't know where the pollen tube pushes the membrane in. Maybe there. Okay. Uh, maybe that's also... Uh, the structure is known only from ultrastructural studies, so from uh, ele transmission electron microscopy. And it looks like it, is, it has a lot of invaginated membranes. Okay. This is typical, usually, of a secretory cell. So you have a lot of cell surface, so you can secrete a lot of substances. And that's really all we know. So we have these uh, lots of cell wall imaginations, mm -hmm. and there is some amorphous material in between, which people think is secreted material. Um, but really, you know, with uh, with modern microscopy methods, this has not been looked at very carefully. This is really just happening now. So, sir, so the pollen tube entry, uh, where what's our best bet? Where does it enter through? So it first comes in touch with the filiform apparatus. Right. So for a while, people thought it would then grow around the synergy. Okay. Now, based on these recent pictures Nick got, I think it will actually push into. And then it would push through the filiform apparatus problem. Yes, yeah, so that's what I'm asking. If it's pushing into through the cell, is it through the filiform apparatus or through something? Okay. Else? We don't know yet, but I would think it's the filiform. I, I speculate it's the filiform apparatus. But we don't know. That's what, what Nick is looking at. So maybe a final question. It was a nice talk. Uh, so I wanted to know uh, what drives the expression of RBR1 uh, initially before fertilization happens? Yeah, OK. So um, RBR1 is a cell cycle regulated gene. So it starts to get expressed in G1 because it's blocking the S phase. And that expression, in turn, depends on events that happened before. Now, the cell cycle machinery is like a, a machine where you, know, you have one phase, you set up the next one, then you set up the next one. And so it also depends on other cycling-dependent kinases that initiate events that lead to its expression. That happens at the end of M phase, beginning of G1. Then RB comes up and blocks S phase until it gets degraded. And the, the cell cycle is like a, almost like a, an engine of a car no? with its four, four tucts, I don't know in English, okay. and vier tucked motor. And each step has to precede the next one. And the RB only gets expressed before S phase. There, there's one more there. Yeah, so uh, you had mentioned that in Arabidopsis the sperm is tricellular, and once it comes and sits on the uh, pollen, like the tube, it will start growing. So while it is growing, uh, you, is it that the volume of this thing is constant, or uh, it actually increases in volume? Yeah. And it's an in interesting, very interesting question. So it's tricellular because the pollen grain itself is a large cell. Yeah. And inside that cell, you have the two sperm. So, so they have been internalized into the ah, pollen. I see. But the tube that grows is that pollen cell, and that grows very fast. Now, 
it grows so fast and so long. No, in in maize, it can be that long. It grow, it pollinates a silk, and it grows 20 so it, centimeters it's overnight. It's not like some sort of angular migration where so the you, cell is coming. So the 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 nucleus of the big cell is at the tip first, and it's trailed by the two sperm, and it goes down the tube. And once the tube has grown a certain bit, it basically builds a wall at the end. And then it grows further, it builds a wall. So it's always only the tip that has the cytoplasm. Ah. And it makes constrictions, or we call them callous blocks, as it grows along. So it doesn't massively enlarge the cytoplasm because it, you know, it travels with the tube. Yeah. And the rest is dead, basically. So it's a, it's a very uh, inventive system like that. Otherwise, you would have to multiply the cytoplasm tremendously, right? which would be hard in such a short time. Yes. Yeah. OK, so with that, uh, maybe we can thank the speaker once more for a wonderful talk.